A social worker in an outpatient mental health clinic is preparing to go to lunch. As the social worker is putting on her coat she notices that there is a Middle Eastern family in the waiting area. Another staff member enters the waiting area and shouts, oh my god, what's that smell? Then begins to spray air freshener near the family. What ethical principle is the staff member not practicing? A. Importance of human relationships. B integrity c dignity and worth of a person d competence c dignity and worth of a person According to the NASW Code of Ethics, Value, Dignity, and Worth of the Person Ethical Principle, social workers respect the inherent dignity and worth of the person. Social workers treat each person in a caring and respectful fashion, mindful of individual differences in cultural and ethnic diversity. Social workers promote clients' socially responsible self-determination. Social workers seek to enhance clients' capacity and opportunity to change and to address their own needs. Social workers are cognizant of their dual responsibility to clients and to the broader society. They seek to resolve conflicts between clients' interests and the broader society's interests in a socially responsible manner consistent with the values, ethical principles, and ethical standards of the profession. What is not one of the six core values of social work? A. Duty to warn. B. Competence. C. Integrity. D. Social justice. A. Duty to warn. Duty to warn is not one of the six core values of social work. A clear case of duty to warn occurs when a client reports clear intent to harm another and has both the motivation intention and means to fulfill this threat. It becomes incumbent on the clinician to report the client to both the police and the third party. You are speaking with a co-worker at lunch about an ugly sweater party that you want to attend during the holiday break, but you're having trouble finding an ugly sweater. Your co-worker states you should ask Sarah, a female client that receives services at the agency, all of her outfits are horrible. What should the social worker do next? A. Speak to your co-worker to discourage unethical conduct. B. Report the comment to your supervisor. C. Laugh and agree with your co-worker. D. File a complaint with human resources. A. Speak to your co-worker to discourage unethical conduct. Direct communication is the best approach when dealing with unethical behavior in the workplace. If you allow something to continue, you are serving as a party to the situation. Confrontation may seem scary, but if you approach it with concern for the individual, you are most likely to have a successful outcome. If you are unable to intervene or talk your co-worker out of committing the behavior, your best course of action is to tell your supervisor about what you observe. If the situation involves your boss, consult with human resources or consider making an anonymous report. On a macro mezzo or a micro level, a social worker ensuring that homeless clients have access to food stamps and shelter, helping disabled clients access adequate health care, and ensuring the elderly are protected from financial abuse and theft are all examples of a dignity and worth of a person b social justice c service d importance of human relationships b social justice 
social workers oppose injustice and push for social change, especially with and on behalf of the vulnerable and oppressed. Social justice is a type of justice rooted in the idea that all people should have equal rights, opportunity, and treatment. Definition of social injustice is when actions are taken that infringe upon a group's rights, marginalize their opportunities, or treat them unfairly. Refraining from dual relationships, building trust, helping clients obtain and understand appropriate and available services. Being culturally competent, safeguarding sensitive details about a client and meeting responsibilities to colleagues practice as a professional and the broader society describes what code of ethic. A. Importance of human relationships. B. Integrity. C. Dignity and worth of a person. D. Competence. B. Integrity. Social workers should take measures to care for themselves professionally and personally. Social workers act honestly and responsibly and promote ethical practices on the part of the organizations with which they are affiliated. Integrity in social work also extends beyond an individual's commitment to honesty. The NASW core values also push social workers to serve as checks on the behavior of organizations. As such social workers should take action when they observe policies or practices that fall short of standards for integrity. A social work intern working in a treatment program is completing a mid-term presentation for school about the effects of drug use on mental health. The intern decides that he will discuss a client at the program who is struggling with a heroin addiction. To help him remember what was discussed during a group session the intern records the session on his phone and use clips of the video as part of the presentation. What ethical right is the intern violating? A. Promoting self-determination. B. Conflict of interest. C. Dual relationships. D. Informed consent. D. Informed consent. Informed consent is the process through which social workers discuss with clients the nature of the social worker client relationship. Social workers have a responsibility to keep client information confidential. Confidentiality means that information shared within a relationship will not be shared outside that relationship. Social workers should obtain clients and informed consent before making audio or video recordings of clients or permitting observation of service provision by a third party. Support in providing assistance in counseling. Appropriate care for children in neglectful or abusive situations. Help with accessing food and housing subsidies. Resources for health care and prescription plans. Resources for job training. And adoption and foster care services are all examples of A. Service B. Social justice C. Dignity and worth of a person D. Importance of human relationships. A. Service. Social workers support individuals and their families through difficult times and ensure that vulnerable people, including children and adults, are safeguarded from harm. Their role is to help improve outcomes in people's lives. Social workers maintain professional relationships and act as guides and advocates. Service is the value from which all other social work values stem. Social workers regularly elevate the needs of their communities above their own personal interests and use their skills and knowledge from education and experience to enhance the well-being of others. What are the standards and ethical principles that guide the professional conduct of social workers? A. HIPAA compliance. B. 
Code of Conduct. C. 48 Laws of Power. D. Code of Ethics. D. Code of Ethics. The Code of Ethics identifies core values on which Social Work's mission is based, as well as summarizes broad ethical principles that reflect the profession's core values and establishes a set of specific ethical standards that should be used to guide social work practice. Susan took her car to her local mechanic, and during the conversation he informs her that he has been experiencing some signs of depression. She tells him that she is a social worker with a private practice, and he should come in for an assessment. Overjoyed, he tells her that if she can help him, he will waive the fee for his service. If she takes his offer this would be an example of a. Dual relationships b. Bartering c. Service d. Importance of human relationships B. Bartering. Bartering arrangements particularly involving services create the potential for conflicts of interest, exploitation, and inappropriate boundaries in social workers' relationships with clients. Social workers should avoid accepting goods or services from clients as payment for professional services. However, social workers should explore and may participate in bartering only in very limited circumstances. The son and daughter-in-law who are live-in caregivers of an elderly client may not be fully addressing his needs according to a home health suggestion. The client is seldom ever taken out of his rear bedroom, which has no windows and neither a radio nor a television. The referring nurse addressed other signs of deteriorating skin, loneliness-induced sorrow and inadequate nourishment. The caregivers now openly support placements since they have publicly acknowledged that they are unable or unwilling to meet the client's needs. However, they stress that they have quit their employment to care for the client, that they are surviving off of the client's retirement funds, and that the house which may be sold to pay for care was left to them by a will. They are therefore reluctant to make the essential adjustments for placement. A social worker's first response should be to a. accept that the caregiver's situation cannot be changed at this time. b. refer them to a caregiver education seminar coming up in two months c. Arrange a prompt extended family meeting to explore options. d. Contact the local adult protective services to report suspected abuse. d. Contact the local adult protective services to report suspected abuse. The first thing a social worker should do when reporting abuse suspicions is notify the area's Adult Protective Services APS. If the main issue is subpar treatment, it could make sense to delay a referral with ongoing nurse visits until after a larger family meeting has been organized option C. But withholding financial resources, the house, isolating the client, and failing to meet their dietary and emotional needs is obvious maltreatment. Most states have mandatory reporting requirements when abuse is evident therefore the social worker could not ethically or legally decline the APS referral. The abuse can continue, thus option A is definitely improper. Option B is unacceptable since it postpones any change in the ongoing abuse for at least two months. Physical abuse, financial exploitation, and neglect as well as verbal and emotional abuse are all forms of elder abuse with family members being the most prevalent offenders. The most prevalent type of maltreatment is neglect. Living on the client's income and in the client's home are high-risk characteristics as are one a difficult to manage client, aggressive, demented, argumentative, etc. Two, compromised caretakers, finances, substance misuse, mental illness, etc. And three, substandard housing crowded, inadequate, etc. Mary is a social worker at an outpatient mental health clinic doing intakes. One day her high school sweetheart John comes in for a screening and assessment. Upon completing the intake, 
John invites Mary to dinner after she gets off of work so they could catch up on old times. Mary agrees. This would be an example of A. Bartering B. Conflict of interest C. Integrity D. Dual relationship D. Dual relationship. Dual or multiple relationships occur when social workers relate to clients in more than one relationship, whether professional, social, or business. Dual or multiple relationships can occur simultaneously or consecutively. Social workers should not engage in dual or multiple relationships with clients or former clients in which there is a risk of exploitation or potential harm to the client. In instances when dual or multiple relationships are unavoidable social workers should take steps to protect clients and are responsible for setting clear appropriate and culturally sensitive boundaries. A former client you saw for several years has contacted you to request copies of his records. You feel strongly that by allowing your client to read his records, you would be causing him serious harm. What should you do? A. Give the client copies despite your reservations. B. Document the client's request and the reason for denial, and refuse to let the client have the copies. C. Give copies to the client's closest family member, and explain to that person your reservations. D. Refuse to give the client copies, and do not explain why. B. Document the client's request and the reason for denial, and refuse to let the client have the copies. Section 1.08 of the NASW Code of Ethics, Access to Records, states that there are times when a client's access to his or her own records could cause harm. In these situations, social workers have the right to limit access to records, though clients' requests and the rationale for withholding some all of the records should be documented in client's files. Also, a brief explanation may be given to the client. You should not give copies to anyone other than the client, especially if you are afraid it could do harm to the client. In regard to unauthorized illegal immigration, the National Association of Social Workers NASW, has taken a strong position. The position entails all of the proceeding, with the exception of the following. A. Opposing any mandatory immigration reporting by social workers. B. Facilitating documentation and benefits for undocumented residents. C. Advocating for rights and services for undocumented residents. D. Transitioning undocumented immigrants back to their homeland. D. Transitioning undocumented immigrants back to their homeland. The NASWS position on illegal immigrants underwent its most recent adjustment in 2018, and it now supports these individuals and families in obtaining rights services benefits education, health care, mental health care, and other services whenever it is practical. The NASW Code of Ethics instructs members to refuse mandatory reporting not only from social workers, but also from those in the health education, and mental health fields as well as from decision makers and those who deliver public services. Additionally, it is necessary to acknowledge that illegal immigrants are particularly vulnerable to exploitation and abuse, and to provide them with all necessary protections against violence, especially violence against women and other forms of abuse and exploitation. All of these services has to be provided in a culturally competent way. A client enters a neighborhood counseling center looking for help. He talks about the need to work on some interpersonal challenges and is pleasant and readily motivated. He reports visiting a different social worker over the last eight months when questioned about prior therapy. He must now find services closer to home due to a change in his work schedule. 
When presented a document authorizing communication with his former social worker, he reacts angrily and anxiously and refuses to consent to it. The best response in this situation would be to a. Discuss his concerns and support him, but require the collateral contacts. b. Refuse services to the client based on his refusal to permit collateral contacts. c. Accept the client's need to keep his therapeutic past private. d. Do none of the above. a. Discuss his concerns and support him, but require the collateral contacts. The best course of action is to listen to his concerns and offer to help, but the collateral touch is necessary. Building a therapeutic relationship with the client is essential, but not at the expense of necessary collateral encounters. If treatment was ineffective, the client should have every opportunity to voice his concerns, and should also feel supported. A protracted therapeutic relationship should not be limited by a client since crucial information may be lost and therapeutic work may be impeded even while some collateral relationships, such as with an enraged ex-spouse, may be reasonably rejected. These individuals are required by law to report suspected or known cases of abuse and have a personal duty to report known or suspected cases of abuse or neglect affecting children adults, the elderly, dependent adults, and adults with disabilities. These professionals are designated by their occupation as a. Child Protective Services b. Social Services c. Mandated Reporters d. Compliance Officers c. Mandated Reporters Reporting child, elder, or dependent adult abuse or neglect is a personal obligation for mandated reporters. Although the term mandated reporter is most often used to refer to those who are forced to file reports of alleged child abuse, it can also refer to people who file reports of alleged abuse of adults, the elderly, people who are dependent on others and persons who have disabilities. Specifics vary by jurisdiction abuse that must be reported may include neglect, as well as financial, physical sexual, or other forms of abuse. Mandated reports who have taken on full or part-time responsibility for the care of a child, a dependent adult, or an elderly person are eligible to submit required reports whether they are paid or not. 